Hi, everybody. Stephanie Rupert here, host of the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we rethink, reinvent, and gain a deeper understanding of the stuff that matters most. Now, today in episode five, we have on Professor Lisa Sedaris, who is challenging the way that we think about how to be good as humans, especially in the modern world. So I first encountered Professor Sedaris's work while I was working on my dissertation. And there was a chapter in my dissertation about a scientist, one whom I love deeply. His name is E.O. Wilson. And in my work, I, am, I study the way that he relates to science. I study how he develops feelings of wonder with respect to the world through science. And Professor Sedaris has analyzed this kind of phenomena at great length. She has studied Wilson. She studied many other people who do this sort of thing because there are many people who do this sort of thing. And she has come to the conclusion, she makes the argument that science, as valuable as it might be, cannot actually facilitate the kind of experiences of wonder that we need in order to love nature, in order to take care of nature, in order to have some sort of environmental ethic. And I found her work to be enormously useful because as we are attempting to become stewardesses of the earth, right, stewards of the earth, as we are attempting to work in a globalized world, we need to figure out how to coexist, how to take care of one another, how to make it work for you know, several billion people. So she's wonderful. Does really brilliant work. And we're going to talk a lot about wonder. We're going to talk about science. It's going to be great. Quickly, I want to let you know a little bit about her background. So I will read you her bio. Elisa Sedaris received her PhD from Indiana University in 2000. Before starting her current post at Indiana University, she taught both at Pace University in New York City and at McGill University, which is a big deal, in Montreal. She has published two major books in the field of religion. The first was Environmental Ethics, Ecological Theology, and Natural Selection, which critiques the tendency of Christian environmental ethics, or what they call ecological theology, to misconstrue or ignore Darwinian theory. Her second book is called Consecrating Science, Wonder, Knowledge, and the Natural World, and this is the one that I have read in excruciating detail. And this one examines how scientific rhetoric and narratives around wonder actually pit science against religion. So... These are very important ideas, and I'm really excited to get started. I will uh, bring her on right after we finish a couple of quick notes about the podcast. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for listening. Uh, secondly, show notes can be found at my website, uh, stephanieruper.com. And third and finally, uh, if you would like to leave a review for a podcast, that would be really great. I do, as a gesture of gratitude, like to uh, give away free books a lot. I mean, my library is constantly flying off my shelves because I'm giving them to friends and the like. So if you leave a review of the podcast, you can take a screenshot of it and then you can email it to the email account for the podcast, which is tmoeverything at gmail.com. I know that that doesn't sound very official, but everybody recognizes Gmail. So I chose it, tmoe, tmoeverything at gmail.com. You can, uh, and then you will automatically be entered into this drawing, which happens once a week. And the list of books that I am giving away is hosted on my website. You can find it at stephanieruper.com slash book giveaway uh, if you're interested. But I promise you don't have to read the list. All of the books are really great. And you just pick one and I'll send it to you. And that's, that's that. Uh, also, if you have any questions uh, regarding these episodes, I do recap, debrief, talk about these things in other episodes on social media, what have you. And so please send them along to uh, the email account, and then we will hopefully address them in an episode. Uh, I want you to be as involved as, as you would like. You are welcome here. So thank you, and here we are with Professor Lisa Sedaris. Uh, welcome, Professor Sedaris. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm well. We're on a bit of a, a time gap here, everybody. It's very, very late for me and very, very early for the professor. She's in Australia and was really- It's not that early. It's, not, it's almost nine. So. Mm, well, I'm a graduate student, so that's very early for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I already 
Uh, I, I <clears throat> talked a little bit about you, but it's always really good to, you know, hear it, uh, hear it from your own mouth, your own words. And so if you could tell us a little bit about um, what you work on, why, you know, why it's important to you, why you think it's important for the world. I definitely think it's important for the world. So <laughs> for the world, um, it sounds pretty grandiose, but it is, I, I think, um, important <laughs> anyway. So, um, you know, what do you do? Well, um, I am very interested in ethical issues at the intersection of science and religion. So um, for me, mostly that's been environmental issues. And I, I sort of came out of a, a background in history of science, which is what I studied prior to sort of coming to religious studies. So I, I think I, I still kind of use that, that background in the things that I look at. Um, but I'm especially interested in the ways that, that science is kind of used or misused or abused or ignored um, in culture at large and in kind of in religious ways in particular. And um, so I'm in Australia right now. I gave a couple of talks here recently and, and after hearing me two or three times, <laughs> some of the people here said, so you're kind of a debunker, which I thought was funny. Um, because when I was young, I was sort of interested, like really young, like a teenager and, you know, um, high school age. I was interested in, in debunking in the sense of um, those like skeptics who go around and try to try to prove that claims to the paranormal are, are false and things like that. And I've, of course, changed entirely since then. But there's still a, a kind of debunking thing in me, I guess, where when I see things that I think are are wrong or need to be called out in some way that seems to kind of motivate me to to write about something that I, I want to say look at this thing it's what these people are doing you know it's um problematic somebody needs to say something about that so <laughs> so maybe that does sound a little grandiose but it's <laughs> that it seems that i have that tendency for some reason so yeah i have a friend who says sometimes people need to be bothered you know sometimes yeah. Sometimes we need to be um, provoked in a certain way. And what's very interesting about what you do, again, is that your first book sort of it criticized a religious approach to ethics and, and nature. And then your next book, it criticized a scientific approach. Yeah. And yeah. Norm normally people would take one side or the other. But yeah. you're just like, hey, I'm here to point out, to point yeah. out some, to point out what you're doing here and to try to like help yeah. us you know, self-correct together. Right. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think I've always been interested in sort of finding that middle ground between kind of either turning religion into science or turning science into religion. And, you know, both of those extremes I have always found sort of problematic. So, you know, I see the second book, Consecrating Science, as being kind of a, a sequel to the first book. But other people see it as being sort of the opposite sometimes, as though I've recanted or I've, you know, abandoned my commitment to science or something. But to me, it's all of a piece, you know, that I see that there are kind of these extremes on both ends. And I'm still trying to articulate the way that science um, should appropriately play a role in religion and ethics. Yeah. And I'm not done doing that. <laughs> No, never. But, there was mm -hmm. this, um, you wrote a paper before the book that was, you know, with the same themes. Was that in 2015? And then there was a group of scholars who responded yeah. to it. Yeah. And, and I read all of their critiques, all of their responses to you. And I read your response to them. And I was thinking what you wrote the whole time. I was like, man, all of these people are like, kind of missing the point. Right, and, and like, they're so like really angry about it too. You know, like they got really worked up about it. Right, like she's abandoning science. She's not understanding science. She's not paying attention X, Y, and Z things. And um, but it seemed to me that you know you were making it just a very simple argument, but simple but powerful argument about what science can do, and and not for everybody. I think a big problem in this discourse is people assume that their idea is going to work for everybody mm -hmm. but yeah. that's that's your key argument right is like this scientific idea about wonder this scientific idea is not we can't say it's going to be the solution for seven billion people right <laughs> yeah and i think people have these kinds of camps you know where they have like a particular axe to grind i find in, in the field that i work in especially that 
there's a lot of people who have sort of had like a deconversion of one form or another, like they, they were once religious and then they, they, they want to sort of, um, they sort of are recovering from some kind of, especially a conservative religious background. So they, they go the other way and they just sort of take all of those same impulses and then apply them to science. So they become evangelists for science. Mm. You know, or there are people who are very threatened by science and they want to sort of defend theology from it. And so if you if you try to sort of stake out this middle ground, people are angry about that. I mean, that's the peculiar thing, you know, that, oh, well, we thought you were on our side and they can't sort of rec I mean, I don't know. Some people, a friend of mine says that academics are kind of the, the most unnuanced readers. And sometimes I think that's true, you know, like they don't actually read what you wrote. Instead, they just sort of react to some kind of um, caricature, you know, of what you've said. So absolutely. I actually I wrote a op ed once that I never sent to anybody because I didn't think anybody would publish it, but about academia and how nobody's actually listening. Right. Like where people set up straw men. And they yeah. take you and they pick your quotes, you know, and they right. like, they cut you off before you finish your sentence. And, and, and then they, they turn you into an argument that, that you're absolutely not. And it's, it's very problematic. And I think a lot of people in these debates, and especially ones who um, are in the academy, will, will like, will, as, will, will assume that they're correct, right? They will assume that their, uh, that their position and whatever, you've read all the literature on one side. Mm -hmm. And so, what, you know, what's, what's the point? But it's just like my friends on Facebook who, you know, don't read an article and they criticize it, you know, and, and they get... You know, I wonder if some of it, yeah, some of it is actually because of social media or, um, you know, the, the whole comment section phenomenon <laughs> that we've forgotten how to read, you know? Mm -hmm. We just sort of get what we think is the, you know, the gist of something and then start reacting to it. Right. And we also, you know, we stake our careers mm -hmm. on, on making these arguments. And, and that's really clear yeah. both in the humanities, but especially in the sciences, you know, like you make yeah. an argument and that's your stick. And if you get proven wrong, like. Mm. And of course, that's the opposite of how scientists like to present themselves. You know, the thing that's supposed to be so special about what scientists do is that they're not attached to their ideas and that they, you know, everything is provisional and everything can be, um, you know, tested and revised. But yeah, people do, scientists as well, get very invested in their ideas. And, you know, I mean, I, that's understandable. But um, I think it's sort of dangerous to, to, to you know, to, to put all of your energy and, you know, years of your career into particular ideas, especially when you're trying to kind of convert other people to, to seeing the world and you're, you know, in that way. And then if someone comes along and critiques that, you know, there's, there's so much resistance to any dissent. And I've really seen that a lot in, in the work that I've done recently. It's kind of, it's kind of been surprising. I mean, because my first book was also sort of taking on like big names in the field. And I was, you know, a pretty junior scholar at that point, but it never really occurred to me, you know, that anyone would say like, oh, you can't say things like that, hmm. you know, but in, in my recent work, I actually encountered some things like that, like, you know, people trying to, you know, to actually stop me from publishing or presenting, um, wow. cutting, cutting me out of, you know, um, a series of lectures that was posted where mine wasn't posted and all the other ones were. So like, wow, that's really, so that's the danger, I guess, of, you know, putting so much of your career into one particular mm. set of ideas that um, it makes people very unable to listen to critique. Yeah, this is also a sign for you personally that your work is needed, right? That your work is important if people are... Well, it's, it was definitely more grist for my mill. I mean, I have to say that it kind of proved the point that I was trying to. This is that there are sort of cult-like dimensions, you know? Mm -hmm. and that there is a, um, yeah, a dogmatic kind of investment in some of these ideas, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, um, I did my master's degree in a seminary um, at Boston University, and... Mm -hmm. I had been friends with people who were scientists forever and I was in the sciences and uh, 
my friends were so puzzled. They were like, why, what, what could you possibly learn from people who are religious? And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, you never know until you ask them. Right. Yeah. Um, But we are finding, you know, increasingly these, you know, people are staking, staking their ground. And I think developing stronger and stronger attachments to either side and really exasperated by things like new atheism and, and yeah. And the wars, you know, the, the culture wars. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 scary, but that's that's precisely why I want to be having conversations like this, uh, and why. Well, I mean, I think that science is. Um, I mean, I guess it's sort of filling a void that's been created by, you know, secularization, um, or just religion taking on different forms. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's understandable that people would kind of turn to science for some sort of meaning making, and I think in the West especially, I mean, America, but I see it other places too. There, you know, I think science journalists are partly complicit in this because of the way that um, science is presented as this very heroic and epic enterprise and just the, the recourse to um, the language of myth. And, you know, <laughs> um, that, that kind of thing, really, you grow up in that culture where, where science is presented as this kind of you know, this different kind of thing, like the people who do science are special, um, almost godlike people. And um, it's not surprising that that's, that's something that the people turn to, to try to, you know, supplement or replace religion. Yeah, so, so let's dive into that. So it's what are, I know that there's many different branches, you know, many different ways that people are doing this, but generally speaking, like what are people doing now you know, turning to science, how are they mm-hmm. mm, aggrandizing it, right, of mid some sort of apotheosis? How is science becoming this thing? Well, I mean, more? yeah, I think, I don't, I don't think it's, it's actually new, but I think these, um, this tendency sort of comes and goes, and I, I don't, I don't know why, for example, at the moment, we seem to be in one of these phases, again, where science is sort of taking on this, this function of of religion or a kind of um, um, sort of just a, a grand synthesis. I mean, there've always been people who, you know, at least I, I studied the sort of Victorian period when I was in grad school. So, um, you know, people who would take Darwin's ideas or um, social Darwinism, you know, people like Herbert Spencer, who would, you know, want to create this whole blueprint for society. And so there's, there's always been that kind of impulse, but it seems to, to come out at particular times. Um, and I think like the 70s was one of those times too with Carl Sagan and um, when you first started getting a lot of these, you know, E.O. Wilson, again, you know, people writing these kinds of grand, you know, accounts of human nature or of the cosmos and where we fit into it and that sort of thing. So, um, so at the moment, I mean, the, the, the movements that I'm looking at, these go by different names like the Epic of Evolution big history, which by the way is kind of big in Australia, actually, it's sort of, yeah, one of the big proponents of big history is in Australia, uh, David Christian, Mm -hmm. Um, or the universe story. So all of these are these kind of sweeping cosmic narratives that try to to tell us how we fit into the big story. And the idea being that somehow without fitting into this big story that people are sort of lost, you know, that there's kind of sense of meaninglessness that this gives us some direction, you know. So, so there's a kind of interesting assumption that, as you were saying earlier, that that everyone feels the same need. I mean, obviously, the people writing these narratives and evangelizing them, they must feel that need very strongly. But then they sort of project that on the rest of us and say, you know, you need this story <laughs> because you know whatever meaning you think you have is is actually inferior, you know, to what we can provide. And that's where the wonder part comes in because what I got very interested in was the way that um, that wonder seemed to be the crux of all of this. Like, you know, whatever you think wonder is, or whatever sources of wonder you have in your life, we have something better. And um, you know, it comes from science, and it's and and that's where the new atheists too, I think, have played into this because that's really been Dawkins line for a long time to say, you know, your, your puny little paltry <laughs> forms of wonder that you get, you know, in your, in your life from religion or, you know, 
you know, uh, the paranormal or magic or whatever stupid things you believe in. If you would just turn to science, you would see that science is sort of the ultimate form of wonder. So, yeah. yeah. And, and what, and this is something that was a really significant part of my life growing up. And it's why I went into the sciences in the first place, right? Because mm -hmm. I was looking for a wonder that was outside of religion specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was raised in a home that was very unfriendly to, to religion. And so I did, I turned to the sciences, but it occurred to me before, right before I went to seminary that I had been dismissing the religious perspective. I had been dismissing it Mm -hmm. all along, even while priding myself on open-mindedness, right? And, and Richard Dawkins, um, and actually there's a, another man on this podcast who builds a spiritual, he calls it spiritual naturalism. His name is Professor Eric Steinhardt. He builds a spiritual mm -hmm. naturalism on mm -hmm. top of um, Dawkins's work. Yeah. And it's fascinating. And, and, and I like what he does with it, but there is always this, you're absolutely right, this like superiority, especially in you know, and people um, like Dawkins, you know, who are so, yeah. so adamant that science is where the wonder is at. But your critique of right. the wonder of science is that it's too abstract. Is that correct? Well, I mean, it is abstract for most people because, I mean, there's the strange sort of move of trying to convert you to science that, as you said, is not just like another form of wonder. It's it's the superior form of wonder. Um, but, but of course, if you're not a scientist, you don't actually have access to it yourself. Um, so, so then you have this kind of arrangement where it's, wonder is mediated by, you know, by these experts, you know, the people who do have access to it. And in a strange way, it kind of, you know, it replicates some of the worst aspects of religion in terms of setting up this hierarchy of those who have, you know, received the revelation in some sense and are then going to translate it to, you know, to the, uh, the masses. So, you know, I think it would be, it would be fine to say that, you know, science is a source of wonder. It is a source of wonder, but it's, it's when they make that kind of superlative claim that, you know, that if you haven't experienced the wonder of science, which of course you can't actually experience unless you're a scientist, um, at least not in any direct way, then you really haven't experienced wonder at all. Hmm. Yeah, so this, this piece of wonder, um, can you expand on it and why you think it's important for our experience as, as humans? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I got interested in wonder um, partly from working on Rachel Carson, who's someone I'm also very interested in, and, um, you know, she wrote about wonder as the thing that that sort of helps us retain, I guess, our, our moral compass in life. So that if mm -hmm. if one kind of appropriately attaches themselves, you know, to nature early in life, then that becomes um, a source of, of values for the rest of one's life that allows you to sort of, um, I guess, sort of you know, to critique or differentiate between ethical and unethical ways of being in the world. So that, you know, it's almost like, I've begun to think of this almost as like an Augustinian kind of thing of, or something platonic, like ordering your love towards some ultimate good, which I think for her was nature. Um, and if you can do that, then that gives you this kind of, um, an ethical orientation on the world, so not necessarily telling you in some specific sense, you know, how to how to conduct yourself ethically in an applied way, but just it's more of an orientation. It's a way of, of um, it's a way of being in the world that keeps one humble, um, that is associated with a lot of other virtues like caution, prudence you know, um, that one doesn't blunder into things when, when one has this kind of um, anchoring and wonder. But then, you know, so on the one hand, wonder is associated in a way with children and this kind of innocent response. But then it's also the, you know, it's the, the sort of disposition that's most associated with, with the sort of omniscient scientist 
who, you know, again, has, has a kind of complete understanding of the cosmos, things that most of us can't understand. So it's very interesting in that way how it has these dimensions of, you know, the kind of the innocent child and, and the most sophisticated um, godlike scientist. And the two of those sometimes even come together. And um, think of a figure like Einstein, you know, who's, you know, the, you know, the paradigm of a, you know, paradigmatic, you know, genius, the symbol of the scientific genius, but also this very childlike character, you know, sort of goofy, sticking out his tongue, you know, kind of thing. And there's a way in which um, wonder, as it's as it's seen as the prerogative of the scientist almost sort of like gets them off the hook in that way because whatever kind of being they are they're not like the rest of us i mean either they're just the you know the child who's um you know playing on the beach with all the pretty pebbles to use these kind of metaphors that scientists sometimes use you know um or they're you know they're the sort of have this sort of godlike attunement to the universe and you know, so they're not like the rest of us, you know, they're not held to the same kinds of moral standards because they're so compelled by wonder that they can't stop themselves from doing what they do. So um, I wrote a paper about the, the, the role of wonder in the making of the atomic bomb and looked at a lot of the discourse of wonder there. And it's very interesting as kind of blend of the, you know, of the um, innocent child, um, you know, whose who's curiosity sort of gets them into trouble or something, and the sort of godlike entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's, it's legit, you can use it to legitimize things like building an atomic right. bomb. So I can, wonder can become an excuse, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. There's like a, there's a particular power about it, right? It's very compelling very compelling to us as human beings, perhaps one of the most compelling right. things there is, which is why I presume it's, it's, it's important for um, your ethical system, you know, how powerful. Right, so you've got kind of, you know, purveyors of science and religion, you know, both kind of like competing for our sense of wonder, you know, like here, we've, we've got the, the wonder over here, you know, <laughs> like, oh, no, we've got something better over here. And, um, that's that's what I began to see and sort of looking at the the discourse of these cosmic stories you know that it's um it's a way of trying to to orient you towards um a particular version of reality you know that and if you're oriented properly towards you know what these people tell you is reality then you know you'll everything will flow from that your you know environmental ethics and you know, your sense of kinship with other life, that everything will sort of come from that. Okay, but they're so going to tell you what reality is, so because you don't, you haven't got it right. <laughs> right, yeah, so then this kinship, right, the kinship is in wonder with nature is, is the motivating thing, right? It's the thing that motivates you to, to want to um, care for it. So where... Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Are, are there different sources of it that are more effective than others? On these accounts, you mean? Or uh, or no, I mean like, well, no, I mean, what is, what is your opinion on, on mm -hmm. where, where that wonder, where the actually motivating wonder is? Well, I think, um, I do think it's really important that, that people attach themselves to nature you know, that's not, that's happening less and less, you know, because of the way the kids grow up. And I mean, my own child, you know, too. I mean, I have a 12 year old who I worry about this all the time, just the, the amount of time that they spend in front of screens and everything. I do think that that is an important thing that, that one attach themselves to, to nature at an early age, but I think people can do it, you know, later in life as well. And sometimes people don't even kind of realize that attachment was there until they're older and they begin to sort of make choices on their own. But um, I mean, I think in some ways, looking at humans from at least a nuanced kind of evolutionary account, it is built into us in some sense. And this is where I think people like E.O. Wilson are right. I mean, I think they're, you know, he's onto something with um, a kind of biophilia hypothesis 
<clears throat> that there's a kind of innate, I mean, he would go too far, I think, in the genetic account, but some kind of innate um, tendency to attach ourselves to life and lifelike processes. So, you know, humans are, are um, I mean, I don't know that we're unique in this respect, but we do have a tendency to to connect with organisms outside of our own species. And other animals do this too. I mean, that's why we've been able to sort of domesticate some animals that we have so easily, like dogs do this as well, you know. And, you know, all of those things are kind of, they're kind of the beginning of an ethic of attachment, but they don't quite get you there because the problem is that we still, you know, tend to, um, our attachments to other organisms tend to skew towards the ones that are that are like us in some way, or that are um, charismatic organisms. Um, and if you, if you do take the kind of genetic line on this, then that's actually what we would expect. That somehow, you know, we attach more closely, more easily, and more closely to those with whom we share the most genetic content. You know, mm -hmm. and so that doesn't get you away from the basic anthropocentric. Um, tendencies that we already have to attach to things that are like us or that, that share our capacities because they're smart, um, because they're um, complex organisms, or simply even because they sort of resemble us physically. So, so I think that there's a, a, a basis there for an ethic of attachment, but that it really requires um, challenging ourselves to attach to things that are very different from us as well. And I think that's where wonder can kind of come in because wonder, as I define it, is really more about, about difference and otherness than sameness. And I think Carson was a good source of that idea because she was actually raised in um, the sort of nature study movement that was very popular in America um, at the time that she was a child. She was born you know, 1907, I think. So, you know, one of the goals of the nature study movement was to, to get children to sort of sympathize or empathize, you know, widely with organisms in the natural world. And they would especially kind of use these, um, what, you know, people call object lessons of sort of trying to, to take the child out into nature, have them interact with an organism that might be one they would normally be afraid of or have a kind of negative um, association because they're predators, things like that. And it was really an exercise in sort of cultivating empathy. And I think you see that in, um, in Carson's writing that she, she tries to sort of push past the kind of anthropocentric tendency to put ourselves in the place of organisms that, that are actually not like us at all. And that um, have, you know, insofar as we can even imagine, like probably a very different experience of the world and a different, um, not just physically their experience of things like living in the ocean, which would be, you know, such a, such a different way of being, um, but that don't, you know, don't necessarily match human capacities in terms of the things that, that they excel at. And I don't think we really know at all, you know, what kinds of things other organisms can do. You know, we just don't have, there's not enough research even, even to understand the kinds of, um, the variety of other minds that are out there, if, if you even want to call them minds, you know, just different ways of being in the world. So that, that's a sort of long answer, but I don't think there's an easy way to get right to an ethical attachment. I mean, one that really, um, is nuanced, you know, there, there's, that we have impulses, but we have to kind of um, supplement them with deliberation and with um, just kind of open-mindedness about the kinds of organisms we share the world with. Right, like the, the first thing that you're looking for is attachment, right? Like mm -hmm. you want to cultivate some sort of attachment and then from there, then you, you know, use science and use reason and use mm -hmm. and experience. I mean, I think experience yes. too. just, you know, for someone like Rachel Carson, it was very much about just, you know, just going down to the tide pools with a flashlight or just going out into your yard at night with a flash, just seeing things and experiencing them firsthand. And 
imagining, you know, what is the world like, you know, for this organism that's so different from me. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And you had me thinking this is a bit of a tangent. But while you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, Rudolf Otto, who was a um, theologian, philosopher, uh, who talked about the relationship between not the relationship, but talked about sacredness as having different components, you know, um, and, and we sort of have this wondering awe or overcome by on one hand, like this there's a connectedness or warmth or safety or protection or like very pretty side of wonder. And then there's also the, the fearful side. And you were talking yeah. about difference, right? And what, mm -hmm. what happens when we encounter difference, you know, you encounter a Pomeranian and you're like, Oh, who yay. <laughs> right. Cause that's familiar to us and it's fluffy and we really like animals that are fluffy, but you encounter mm -hmm. a, a lizard and usually people are like, Meh. right. And so yeah. um, do you see, this kind of the the fearful or the, or the difference being able to inspire attachment to yeah um maybe attachment isn't always the right way of thinking about it but um right yeah i mean i think that that these encounters you know are can serve as a reminder that that you know that we we aren't the center of everything you know that our way of of being in the world is not, um, it's not the way, it's not, it's not that other organisms are just a, um, a kind of inferior version of what we are. They're actually an entirely different thing altogether. So um, I guess that's why maybe thinking of something like empathy, even more than sympathy or attachment is helpful because empathy, as at least as it's defined, I think, properly and carefully is it, it retains that otherness that sense of the the other it's not me putting myself in your place exactly it's me you know seeing the world through your eyes i mean if that makes sense it's not i'm not i'm not me seeing things through your eyes i'm, I'm actually trying to see something in a very different way so that can be very disorienting and i think you know to to assume we can attach ourselves maybe as asking too much. It's more about letting other things be the way that they are and not trying to assimilate them to, um, to our own view of reality because it's threatening, you know, it's threatening to encounter something that doesn't make sense to you or that doesn't, um, doesn't fit your own, um, your own, your own sense of what's beautiful or orderly or um, even ethically right, you know, when you think about the way that, that other animals uh, prey on animals, the way that sometimes they, they, they do things that, <laughs> you know, in, in the human realm just seem immoral and horrifying. That's you know, that's not wrong in the animal world. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really challenging thing. It's much more difficult than just sort of attaching yourself to the, to the cute organisms. I've just been looking at koalas here. Um, <laughs> just, um, and of course, that's kind of, you know, the perfect example of an animal everyone loves, but it's also, it's going extinct, you know, it's endangered. Um, these koalas were in a nature preserve where they're breeding them and putting them back into the wild. So, you know, why is it even with all of this, you know, with the most adorable animal almost you can imagine that everybody wants to see, how come we haven't been able to save them? So it, it seems that, you know, that kind of attachment to the cute things doesn't really work anyway. Somehow we've not been able to translate that sort of love um, and affection into something that's in their interest. Right, or so, something that you want to act on and put effort into, right? Because it, it takes, it definitely, it definitely takes effort. And I think you're right that empathy is, is really crucial. I encountered this idea. I think I encountered it in a paper that you wrote. About, I have written a little bit about empathy. So Yeah, well, you were, you were talking about how we think of animals as wild, you know, but perhaps it's the opposite, right? Perhaps they're, they're going about their lives and they're, it's normal for them and it's domestic, right? And mm -hmm. we're like, we're the crazy ones, right? 
Mm -hmm. And that was so revelatory for me to think like, yeah, you know, we're the ones who don't want to, you know, we're the ones who have all of this power and choose to watch, you know, videos of raccoons riding bikes on YouTube instead of Mm -hmm. doing something good for the raccoons, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's really fascinating. So, uh, the, so then science, right? How, how can science, how can we like relate to science in a way that is helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So we understand that like, maybe it's not the most effective thing for cultivating this sense of wonder because it's not an active encounter, but it, you still like, you're not a science hater, right? And this is <laughs> problems. Everybody assumes you're a science hater, but you're not. Right. Because you have to either be a lover or a hater, right? It's not, it's not possible to just sort of yeah. to, to think. Right. But, but you, you have nuance, right? And so, and so what then, what can we, you know, what, what can science do for us? Can it help us? How can we, you know, can we figure ourselves out enough to figure out how to make ourselves want to act? Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the main point I'm trying to make in in this book about science is um, that it's, it's not itself a source of motivation, you know, I mean, science can definitely help us figure out like how to conserve preserve species that kind of thing um, how to manage ecosystems Um, and I think that you know we should try to do that in ways that are that are in keeping with the way the natural processes themselves so for example I mean that's what my first book was really about is sort of um, trying to restore nature back to conditions where nature can function on its own so we we intervene in order to um, not have to intervene or to make up for past interventions Um, I mean, people who don't believe there's any such thing as nature will just reject that. But, you know, I I just don't even want to go there. Um, So I think science tells us how to do things. The problem is, um, I mean, of course, it's always, you know, provisional and, you know, needs to be um, updated and, you know, all of that. But, you know, science is is a great tool for things like that. But but in terms of trying to derive your kind of moral motivation or, or affection, whatever, from science itself, I, I don't think it works that way. Now, there are people who will say, well, it worked that way for me, you know, and that's fine. But, you know, again, to assume that somehow the way to get people to care about the natural world is through, you know, scientific information or study or things like that everybody I just don't think that's the case and you know it worked for Richard Dawkins for example you know he wasn't interested in nature he was interested in books and and that's fine but we don't want to be Richard Dawkins right we don't want to we don't want to raise people to be Richard Dawkins we don't need any more Dawkins in the world at all I think so um (laughs) and you know I don't think that it's it's not easy and I haven't done it you know to try to prove that you know, for example, that that a certain kind of wonder will lead to better ethical engagement with the natural world. Um, but it does seem that, you know, from some studies, you look at the, the kind of childhood experiences of a lot of pioneers in environmental work, and they themselves have typically credited some kind of childhood experience to being introduced to the natural world or or something um or seeing something destroyed that they loved you know like a landscape or a forest or something when they were growing up sarah pike um her book came out recently she writes about a lot about that um for the wild i think is the name of her book so it does seem that that often what motivates people is some kind of connection they feel to a particular place either um, tragically or positively rather than you know when they picked up their you know biology textbook they suddenly became interested in nature so yeah i do think that science can be a really nice supplement to that sort of thing Mm -hmm. you know because we can i think it's important to to be out and encounter and like you know we went on field trips to the zoo growing up, right? And it's like, oh, okay, that's a polar bear. Um, but science has also been able to teach us like that polar bears have feelings, 
right? And we have, right. I think, a huge problem for you know us and our relationships with animals is is a lot of people assume that. Um, they're stupid or they don't feel things or, you know, that they're not conscious. And so harming them yeah. doesn't matter. But I, I, in some ways, science has given us some knowledge yeah. and some ways to like cultivate this empathy, but it's yeah. not one of encounter and wonder. It's one of knowing and then, you know, making provide a context for understanding, you know, why, um, why the geese out back or why the ducks like to um, sleep in a, in a particular way, you know, and that's kind of, mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to know that. It is. And I, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to overstate this. I mean, I think what you just said is really important and finding out, you know, learning these things about, about animals can really, I think they can make a difference to people who think, wow, I mean, this is, you know, then, you know, killing a whale is, is as bad as killing a human or something. Um, I, I still think that, you know, that in and of itself isn't going to get us a more kind of holistic ethic that we need. Hmm. Um, and that's why you see people like, you know, animal rights people continuing to debate with more holistic environmentalists in the sense that, you know, people can get so focused on, you know, the individual capacities and the sentience of complicated non-human organisms that they can't think about, um, you know, those other things in, in the ecosystem that also matter just as much and that, that maybe don't have those qualities. Mm -hmm. But definitely studying science can can change, you know, how we how we look at other animals. There's all kinds of amazing things that they do that we would have no idea they're capable of doing. Yeah. So okay. Um what do we is this uh is this a feasible project you know can we can we realize this will will us as humans be able to you know learn how to be empathetic with other creatures and 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 do you have any ideas and and no pressure <laughs> but do you have any ideas about about what it might take for us to actually achieve this sort of thing well i think that um i think it's sort of the wrong approach to to, to aim for some common global ethic. I mean, as I've argued in my book, I mean, I think that, I mean, going back to some things we were talking about earlier, it seems to me that, that, that people care about particular places and particular um, uh, connections that they have. So the idea that somehow orienting us to the cosmos <laughs> is gonna, gonna get us to some powerful ethic just seems so counterintuitive to me. And in fact, it seems to, it seems to go back to this, this sort of idea of like the whole earth thing, you know, seeing the, seeing the earth from space somehow was this big shift in our environmental thinking. And you hear this sort of thing a lot, but it's a very strange kind of argument that somehow when we can take in the earth as this kind of thing that's out there, this abstract entity, and think of it as a planet that you know we're going to have this conversion towards um, caring more for the things around us. So, I think that unfortunately, what's going to happen more and more in the future is that people will be motivated by um, by negative encounters that they're having of seeing the places that they love destroyed, um, seeing loss of species. Um, you know, trying to deal with the, the tragedy. I think that the climate change and, you know, these incredible extinction events are going to bring. So, um, and that's not something people will see on a global scale, though we talk about it in that way. They're going to see it, and they are seeing it already, in the particular places that they know. One of the problems is that, that people are not as connected to particular places as they used to be. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of an exception because I, I live in a place where I've lived most of my adult life, a place where I went to school and then I came back to teach in that place. Um, so I have like a real connection to a particular area that I love, but I think that also is less and less common. So there are a lot of forces sort of working against 
um, people people having that forming that bond with a particular place. But it seems to me that if you if you look at the history of the environmental movement, when people have become motivated um, and have have you know taken to like activism, it's been on behalf of particular places that they loved. Now maybe there are some people who can sort of attach themselves to the earth as a whole and we do have to think about the earth as a whole because climate change is a place is, a, is an issue that that affects the entire planet but i don't even know how to think that way i find it just sort of overwhelming to think about the planet as a whole i mean i can sort of i can only think about how i feel about the places that i love mm. so you know i think I mean, of course, I don't have a solution to this huge problem, but people have individual stories, communities, communities have individual stories and histories, and those are going to be sort of rewritten by things like climate change. And, but I think it's up to those people, you know, to sort of tell their own story, um, whether it's a story of loss or connection or whatever, um, sort of on the ground rather than from this kind of abstract level of a global ethic. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I hope you're right that, that people will care, you know, that people will have places that they love, you know, it, being in such a urbanized world, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and this is a big piece of what I appreciate about E.O. Wilson's work is he's like, look, we need to, we need to preserve this and we need to be in touch with it. Otherwise we're never, we're never really going to come to love it. You know, and I, I know so many people from, uh, you know, uh, various places, mostly where I'm from originally who wouldn't, wouldn't care, you know, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother them. You know, they wouldn't, yeah, and, they wouldn't have had that attachment. Yeah. When you have whole generations of people growing up, without having that sort of contact. It, yeah, it does, it does worry me a lot. Um, I don't know, I mean, I sometimes think that there'll be some sort of backlash to the kind of artificial worlds <laughs> that we're increasingly living in, just in, in the same way that people have, you know, gone back to vinyl albums, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, or, or people who, you know, really wanna just read a book that you can get your hands on rather than reading things online. You know, that there'll be a kind of, you know, nostalgia for a world that we, we kind of left behind. But I don't know if you can even have nostalgia for something <laughs> that you haven't quite experienced. But um, yeah. it is, yeah, it's a concern that, that there will be people who have grown up entirely their whole lives in a world where they didn't experience books and didn't experience nature firsthand yeah yeah um <laughs> i would like to end on a positive note yeah. <laughs> i would like to end on a positive note um there is hope we can we can do it <laughs> um, yeah i think you know the problem is that the kinds of um the sort of hopeful narratives that seem to dominate and i've been looking at a lot of this in, my work that I'm doing right now, hmm. you know, the way that, that a lot of narratives that we hear sort of describe hope is, is this kind of doubling down on, on, you know, what the same kinds of behaviors that have gotten us here in the first place, you know, like, oh, we're, we're creative, we're creative beings, um, we're, we're world making beings, you know, um, we, we are, um, innovators, you know, all of these, you know, positive terms about how unique humans are because they're so creative and they're so technologically savvy and that, you know, we can always, you know, when the, when, you know, the, when we're in a tight corner, we manage, you know, and it's, it's meant as this kind of inspiring story. Um, but of course, what it's telling us is that we, we just keep doing more of the same, only, only more so. <laughs> so, that raises the question of, of how do people actually change? Um, and, and there's a way in which the story about, about how adaptable humans are 
is really a way of not changing. It's a kind of, you know, adaptability that's the opposite of change because it's not doing the sort of hard work of thinking about, you know, what, what we've done wrong, how we should do things differently, um, instead of sort of falling back on the same kinds of reassurances that sort of what makes us human is, you know, our, our creativity, our malleability, all of those things. So that sounds to me like a religious conversion in some sense. I mean, that what we need is something um, that's much more soul searching than just gathering our tools and preparing, you know, to fix whatever problems we're creating. Yeah, I actually, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think this is a really, really nice note to end on. I have spent a lot of time around people who are doing really inspiring work with technology and, and are going to be able to hopefully help uh, with a lot of these major problems. But I think that this work of trying to understand who we are, you know, mm -hmm. And how we can possibly become better, maybe, you know, and really or maybe like even redefine who we are because the stories we, we keep telling about who we are um, are not, they're not conducive to change. I mean, that's what's so surprising to me about the kinds of narratives that I keep coming across. And they're in popular science and they're in, you know, religion and ecology and all these things is that they're kind of the same story over and over again. I mean, it's like we really don't have any imagination at all. And a lot of them are, are these stories about how, how distinctive and unique and exceptional humans are. You know, it's like, really? That's, mm. that's really <laughs> all we've learned at this point? I mean, we don't even have any idea how exceptional other organisms are because we haven't even really asked that question. So. Yeah, that's, that's very, very true. Um, thank you. I find that to be very profound and I appreciate that a lot. So, um, thank you a lot. We can end here, uh, unless you have anything final you'd like to say. And I don't know, I don't know if you're on social media and you like for people to follow you. Is there, are there places where people can find your work? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on Twitter and Facebook and yeah, I mean, I'm okay. So I can, on I Twitter. Google, cool. Like, Follow yeah. Professor Lisa Sedaris on Twitter. She's brilliant. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, yeah, and for more from me, of course, I'm, I'm Stephanie Ruper and you can find me at stephanieruper.com and the Insta and the Facebook. And um, just a reminder that I am doing uh, those book giveaways. So take a snapshot and send it to me at tmoeverything at gmail.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much and take care. We'll see you next time.